Welcome to another wonderful episode of Minding My Business, the CEO story. This is season three and it's powered by Nucleus Office Parks. And this season we thought we'd get the top IPCs in India, talk real estate for a bit. Please to welcome Anurag Mathur, CEO at Civils India. Hi, great to see you. How are you? I love the painting behind you. <laughs> Hi, Rishi. Thanks. Yeah, uh, it's a nice, nice piece of work, New York City. Great. Civil India's latest report, India Market Snapshot Q322, throws light on key trends and developments across six of India's major office markets, Anurag. Please run us through the details of that report. Look, uh, it's uh, there's a lot that we've covered in the report, but I'll give you some of the highlights. So essentially what we've said in the report is that it's been an exceptional year uh, so far in terms of commercial office markets. We've seen a 57% year-on-year growth at, at a, as of end of Q3 uh, this year. And this is over the previous year, same time, which is a very, very strong um, recovery. And uh, if the trend continues, we got three months to uh, go up in the last quarter. Uh, if that trend continues, we are anticipating the total absorption to get to about 56, 55 million square feet. Now, what that essentially means is that we would be at level or ahead of 2019 absorption number, which was the best year ever in our recorded history. So um, uh, it says a lot in terms of the demand and absorption of uh, commercial, A-grade commercial real estate in India. So it's a, it's a great story actually that's unfolding as we, as we, uh, as we live it. It is indeed. You know, while doing some essential reading uh, on before reaching out to you, I came across a, a very interesting blog on the Seville's official website. It says ESG in industrial and logistic sector in India supporting a positive progressive transition. I'd like you to elaborate on that for our listeners. Yeah. So look, uh, the industrial warehousing logistics sector in India, it's, um, it's a developing sector. It's a sector which is still fairly nascent in India. And, um, because of that or for other reasons, it's a little behind in terms of sustainability, ESG, governance, transparency, and all those things. But as we mature, and we are maturing very, very fast in that sector particularly, um, there is a lot of focus on ESG um, in, in matters such as um, uh, increased transparency, um, gender inclusivity, um, uh, you know, sustainability in terms of construction in terms of usage um, on uh, operations and all that so that is now becoming very very important going forward uh, for um, operators um, in that space uh, so while we will grow and we're growing very very fast in that segment uh, what we have said is that there is a great amount of focus uh, on the esg side as well uh, Many times when rapid growth happens, it happens at the expense of some of these things, such as, such as sustainability governance and so on and so forth. But we are going through a very unique period where there is a very uh, significant focus on the parameters of which, are, uh, which are ESG uh, as such. So that's what the blog is all about, essentially. And it talks in detail on what what is happening and what's going on and where the focus is and so on. Yeah, that's heartening. Seville's latest report, let's move to that, it's uh, on a resurgent flex market. It throws light on how real estate stakeholders perceive commercial office space requirements in a post-pandemic world and how flex space, that is likely to witness a new peak in terms of gross absorption. I'd like you to talk us through that. Basically, basically your thoughts on co-working and flex players. Yeah, look, it's a very interesting phenomena that is playing out uh, globally as well as in India. So if you if you see the whole flex space segment is no more than about seven eight years old. Yeah. Uh, it's not, doesn't in the in the current definition it doesn't go beyond that. We used to have uh, business centers and all that before that, but that's a that's not classically a flex space operator or not nothing of the scale that we're talking about. So this has been growing over the past. Uh, like I said, seven, eight years. And this year has been uh, very interesting. Through the COVID period, uh, flex operators, that segment of the industry has grown. And this year, they are likely to do, have an exceptional year. So 
they lease uh, from the same pool that everyone else leases building space because they don't construct their, they don't own their real estate. So they lease. Now, when I talked of the leasing volume earlier, uh, flex spaces are going to be in excess of about 20% of the market share of the overall space demand this year. This is the highest ever. So, and this is what we had said, we had predicted about, um, and we had done a report, I think I'm going to say 2020, where we had uh, predicted saying the flex market space in a matter of two, three years, will get to a very large amount. And actually that's now turning out to be true. This year we are anticipating the flex space market to go up to about a um, 120 or 130,000 square feet space, which is very, very large. Now, uh, this is now become a very important segment of office spaces as to how companies operate and how people like to go to offices and they work and operate and all that. So it's a very interesting segment and in how the, this industry is playing out. Now there are several micro trends as to why they're doing and how, why they're growing and so on and so forth. But that's a fairly elaborate um, um, uh, you know, explanation. But uh, this is growing very fast and I think uh, it's a very interesting trend that is uh, playing out. And I think one of the main reasons for that is the whole uncertainty at this point in the world, uh, which is, and the flex players in that industry is uh, solutioning or countering that uncertainty. There's a lot of, uh, um, you know, watching over the IT spending and IT outsourcing industry. Do you think the recession in the U.S. will impact U.S.-based corporations and their IT spending and the IT outsourcing business? Look, I'm not an IT expert, uh, so not going to be commenting upon how, why, about how that happens, but I can certainly talk to you about how it impacts or what's going to happen with the our industry, which is the real estate, commercial real estate industry. Now, um, my, my sense is that the recession that's happening in the Western world, it's real. And as a result of that, the big tech are shedding jobs uh, and if they're not shedding jobs, they're certainly not hiring. They're not expanding and all that. So that obviously will have uh, an impact. It's already having an impact where companies are not taking major decisions and, and so on and so forth. But so in that sense, that has a direct uh, impact on our industry because those companies will not expand uh, as such and uh, may slow down their expansion and so on. But again, like I said, I'm not an IT industry expert, I did not an IT expert, so I can't talk too much about it. However, what is also important and that when I say how it relates to our industry is that the IT industry is just coming off the back of just phenomenal growth in the last two years. Now, what has happened is in these the uh, past two years, or in, I'm going to say even three years, there's been very, very aggressive hiring in the, in the IT tech industry that has happened. Ironically, when the, this hiring was happening, no one was going to office. Um, so uh, pretty much every IT company has hired a lot of people, far more than they have the capacity to put them into offices. Uh, so a lot of them are still working from home, gradually returning to office and so on. But at some point when that workforce starts to come back to office and they are, uh, the demand for office space will only go up. Um, and, you know, anecdotally, I can tell you is a lot of companies have as much as doubled their headcount uh, in the COVID period when no one is coming to office. Now, imagine they, they, they don't have enough office space or seats and, and to put them. If those people came back to office, where will they sit? Where will they go to office? What's the work facility like? So therefore, uh, the impact on us, I don't think in our, in our industry is going to be any, in, in, any, in, in any meaningful measure as such. Uh, so I'm not too worried about it. I think we are, uh, we are still going to uh, grow the absorption is continue to uh, is, is is going to be very robust in in a foreseeable future. Yeah. So even though you're not an IT expert, I mean, uh, would you, in that a sense, say at the other end of, at the end of the spectrum, because there are inflation debt, wage hike pressures in the US and Europe, that is leading to more IT jobs in India. That's that's a very 
plausible argument uh that and you know rishi one important factor is i think once again with uh, with the fact that i'm not an outsourcing or an it expert um, my sense is that india is not just a cost arbitrage country anymore we are uh, we are a strong and a and a quality workforce location now so the amount of people that the it industry needs to have to grow their businesses they can't find them in those numbers anywhere else except india so not necessarily are we looking those companies are looking at a cost arbitrage they are looking at people to scale up their businesses and True. there is no other destination besides india for for scaling up those businesses so i think uh, we are in the center and the middle of that whole process well said are unicorns demanding more office space or was that something that happened in july and then kind of petered down died down and i'm just curious to know which city leads the market so um um uh, to answer your reverse i think bangalore pune and hyderabad they have done very well um uh, in that sense uh, even delhi gurgaon uh they are the market leaders in terms of uh, the unicorns and the whole startup uh, economy they have slowed down a little bit but they continue to occupy a lot of space and coincidentally there a lot of them uh, gravitate towards the flex spaces and the flex spaces um, like i said earlier have having the best year and they growing really very rapidly they are uh, mimic, mimicking that that uh, Uh, that trend as to the maximum amount of flex space that you see is unfolding in bangalore pune and hyderabad so that triangle is seeing most of the action and that's where i think the whole unicorns and the startups uh, also are located anurag according to lots of commercial watchers office leasing is up 97% in jan to september in six cities what are the chances of it hitting record numbers uh, this year in 2022 and uh, no. also again you know, is this spurt in leasing also because of the spillover in demand from the last two years yeah so that's true so there is like i said earlier um, in the opening question we've had a very robust and a very very good year in terms of commercial office leasing it's been it's been really strong recovery and and a growth uh and like i said end of this year december 31st uh, this year uh, we may just actually meet or surpass the 2019 number which like i said was the best year ever before covid happened and uh, it uh, it went uh, downwards uh so it, it's it's going to be a very strong year and it is looking like a very good year uh truth be told i do think that a lot of it is a spillover or from from the previous years like i said to you earlier that there was a lot of hiring that happened and there was uh, there wasn't the need to go to office and therefore people did not take space which are doing they're doing now so it's very difficult to distinguish to say what is real growth story happening now and how much is it from the fumes from previous years uh but it's a it's a fair mix and there is um i'm not going to say small but a significant part uh of the previous years uh, hangover that is uh getting executed uh this year what about vacancy levels in office uh, have they also considerably reduced and what could be the the reason for that uh i think the, what we are saying is at this point the vacancy levels are in the vicinity of about 18% grade a of space on a national uh, uh pan india basis uh so uh, look uh, there is there like i said when the demand is so strong um there is obviously going to be pressure on vacancy levels it's uneven the vacancy uh because uh, there are cities where they have very very low vacancies there are cities where there is a higher vacancy and so on uh but it's it's a fairly low number not that small but it there it's a fairly uh, small number but the good thing is that across all cities major developers are still pouring concrete and they're making new buildings and better quality buildings and and um, they they are not stopping um or they're not worried which is a very very good sign right i fully endorse that 
uh, is to to be able to to be prepared for more growth and uh, their sentiment is and their sense is that the growth story will continue which which i like i said i fully endorse and agree with what about new supply of office in the first 9 to 10 months of this year of 2022 so yeah we've had a uh, supply come into the market but obviously it's been uh, slow uh, in the last uh, two years a lot of covid stoppage delays and and so on but uh, con- supply continues uh, to to come in uh at this point we have seen about 42 million square feet or till q3 of this year what about reits anurag now despite the uncertainties uh, how they done and going forward how do you think office reits will grow uh, also your thoughts on industrial and retail reits uh look reit is a fairly new um uh phenomena in india and um, i think uh, as a as an as an asset investment class it's uh, it's going to to grow and it should it's a it's a great product for uh, for everyone uh, in that space so the distribution of dividends has been consistent um it's growing um, which is really the primary objective of reits uh, and it's like i said it's a perfect uh, vehicle to harness public money and for the public uh, to to participate in the real estate story in india it's a yield generating uh, asset class product and all that so reach in india will grow uh, uh, consistently that's my phenomena you will see more and more reach uh, coming into the country getting listed over the next couple of years and all that i am a very very strong proponent of uh, of reach um and i think um there should be more awareness about reits in public to to participate in this whole uh, growth story that is unfolding uh, in commercial real estate both, both in um, office as well as in retail we don't have a retail e- reit yet but uh, we are expecting one to come come through fairly uh, soon that will be a very very interesting product for this uh, market India today is one of the fastest growing e-commerce and third party logistics market. Now given that fact, how the industrial and warehousing property market fared and do you think demand will continue to rise? Yeah, I mean look, the warehousing has been a very very um, interesting sector for a while now and uh, it's a global trend that is playing out. India is no exception. I think India is probably ahead of the curve uh, we are a very vast untapped market in the segment of e-commerce and post the gst um, change that legislation that came about uh, there was there there's been a significant uptick in in realignment of the whole logistics supply chains and as a result of that how the warehousing industry and how they are changing and modernizing and getting more efficient uh so there's a lot of focus and investment uh going into uh that space um uh, uh the demand is primarily from um on the warehousing side i'm talking about is from manufacturing side manufacturers the third party logistics e-commerce organized retail all of those guys everyone is doing well i mean india is a young consumer country so yeah. so there there is there's a lot of um uh uh you know uh, there is a lot to be done in that space there's a lot of headroom for growth over there and then of course is the government's policy uh, the whole policy framework which is supporting uh the logistics and the warehousing and distribution sector i think that's we are we are in the middle of of a, of a minor revolution playing out over there would you safely say that working from office is back as opposed to working from home in that aspect is infrastructure supporting an easier commute to work it's a million dollar question <laughs> and, a, and a and a controversial difficult uh, question look uh, the working from office in the conventional sense that we have known for the last 40 50 years that's probably uh, changing and changing very fast uh, it's been changing for the last several decades but it's changed now 
the change will be fairly compressed and rapid at, at this point. So to expect that all hands in office nine to six every day, that probably is not going to happen. Uh, it was uh, going away uh, before COVID. And I, um, I think COVID just accelerated that whole trend. So I, I don't think uh, that is a likelihood that uh, everyone will come back to office nine to six, five days a week. Uh, that's uh, clearly out. How much will, how much of the population comes back to office? How, 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 how often do they need to come to office and how many do need to come to office? That's a different question. Look, the other point also is um, uh, work, the permanent work from home was a reaction to what happened in the COVID years, that you could not go to office, you should not have been in the offices or in public places at that time. So now that's past. So we, we, that was, to me, was um, an aberration. It was a solution to an unprecedented problem that we had on hand. Can it be a permanent trend? I doubt. Look, um, my sense is, uh, we are a knowledge economy now, uh, which means there is a significant amount of um, uh, focus on innovation, on technology, on efficiency, collaboration and all that. That can't necessarily happen uh, when everyone's sitting from, on, from home and working from home. You need to be together, to be collaborative, to be have, to have a face time, to have impromptu meetings and discussions and so on and so forth. So I think the answer lies somewhere in the middle, that you can't permanently always work from home. There may be some jobs who may not want to come to office or don't need to come to office. That's a different issue. That's, I think, a smaller subset. But on the larger scale, I think there will be, you'll see a mix of uh, a significant amount of people back to office but not necessarily every day, full day kind of a thing. So you will see uh, the ball is still rolling. I don't know where will it end, uh, stop, but that's that's more like where I, I foresee it stopping. Well, what are the office locations to watch out for in Mumbai city? How is Parel, for example, in central Mumbai and BKC, which is Bandakurla complex, faring? Uh, look, uh, Parel is a. It has uh, some traffic problems um, in that location during uh, peak hours, but there are several infrastructural improvements which have been sort of made. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, they're, they're ongoing at this point, uh, and some have already been done, and the others are underway. In my sense, is once that gets uh, gets done in some shape and size, uh, that Parel and Lower Parel will continue to attract uh, and be, a, be an attractive location and, and it should uh, come back. So that to me is, is a very attractive uh, uh, location. It had this traffic issues and all that, but once that's sorted and there's work happening, I think it should be a fairly uh, strong location. Burley again continues to have some good developments um, and uh, 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 it's, it's, I think it's an attractive location. Besides that, in in uh, my my bet will be on Navi Mumbai and and JBLR. Uh, outside of that, I think BKC continues to be a really uh, great spot for most companies to have presence in. Let's look at startups now. How much office space are startups occupying in India? Do you think uh, venture capitalists steering the development of startups and favorable government uh, policies towards startups, and of course. If you look at the third angle, the availability of a deeper talent pool mean that it will impact office space occupied by them. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I talked a little bit about this uh, to you earlier. They are, uh, they are now, the startups are a significant consumer of office space. They are not a fringe player anymore. They are consuming um, a, a more and more office space. Uh, the whole startup economy, because of what's the recession and the interest rates and, and so on and so forth, they are going through a bit of a challenge from my understanding, from my viewpoint. But I don't think that, that necessarily has changed their demand uh, dramatically uh, at this point. Uh, because of the nature of what they do, I think a lot of startups are gravitating towards flex office spaces. Um, uh, and... Uh, 
I think it suits them well because it's, you know, uh, uh, the space and the inventory is, is flexible and they can quickly ramp up or go down as they, the case may be. And like I said, those three, four cities, Bangalore, Pune, Hyderabad and Delhi and Sia, they continue to be the hotspots for the startup organizations, companies. Consider this as uh, some advice you're dispensing. What do landlords need to consider if they need to capture the real estate demand from startups? I think uh, the um, the whole world today has become. I mean, it's it's uh, it's it's a lot more uncertain than it was, let's say, three or five years ago. Um, so therefore, the uh, flexibility has become the biggest mantra in in today's world when it comes to commercial real estate. It's in many other aspects also, but uh, in commercial real estate, it's very important. Uh, so, any which way when you're dealing with occupants, corporations, uh, of consumers of uh, commercial real estate, flexibility does come into play. I think that becomes dramatically more important when you're dealing with uh, with the with the startup players, because uh, the their ability to predict their space requirement three years, five years, nine years, ten years is very difficult. It's very limited, yeah. um, and our industry is capital intensive, intensive industry. Leases are long term, uh, and so on and so forth. So therefore, um, that becomes a challenge uh, for startups is to be able to foretell what their stuff requirements will be staff numbers will be three five years from now and how much they should space they should they should commit to and all that and therefore uh, the flexibility uh, comes into play um, that's what developers will have to and they have been uh, focusing and the way they address it is uh, by having flex space operators at every building level so it's almost now become a hygiene you know, in a sense, when you uh, when you go to a commercial office building, you need to have an ATM and a restaurant and a coffee shop in that building. It's almost become a hygiene factor. Same way, um, at a building level, you need to have some level of a flex space um, operator or a place over there where someone can come in and, and flex and grow uh, as such. Hybrid working as a workspace strategy. How is that looking according to your research, Anurag? Uh, interesting. I think hybrid working is here to stay. Um, uh, companies are, um, are gradually moving to tier three and tier four cities or suburbs of existing metros, which wasn't a very prominent trend um, earlier. We have, uh, in our research, identified 23 viable locations in tier three and four towns in addition to top six uh, uh, or thereabouts uh, cities and their outer precincts to establish these uh, hybrid setups. So our view is, uh, and our research, and we've done some survey, and based on that, we've picked up. So these 23 locations is what we've identified. And I think as a trend, it's, it's going to happen. This is a, going to be a very viable situation given how people are preferring to work these days and all that, and the increasing uh, infrastructure challenges in some of our mega cities and so on. So I think this is an important trend uh, uh, that's playing out, and I think it's going to be here to stay. What about non-metro cities as opposed to urban cities? Are interest levels towards building offices in non-metro cities seeing a rise? Do you think, obviously, that it will then reduce the infrastructure load on metros and that could lead to more equitable growth? It should, ideally speaking. It should um, have a, a calming effect on the major mega cities because, look, frankly, at this point, the, uh, the concentration of our workforce in the six major cities, the seven major cities is just too high and it's, it's, it's growing. And cities are facing the challenge in keeping up with the with that pace uh, of, uh, and frankly, there is not unlimited infrastructure that you can put in these cities. So I think uh, tier two, tier three, tier four cities have to pick up. It's it's time now. 
and the hybrid working, the technology, the, the knowledge industry, I think they will all facilitate uh, the hybrid working in some of these tier three, four cities. Earlier, uh, and we've done this research um, several times over on the viability and feasibility of uh, uh, these cities. Uh, it's, it's, it was always a challenge. Connectivity was a challenge. Infrastructure was a challenge and all that. I think we are now, uh, we are there. We are getting there, if not, if already not there, in terms of several smaller cities, tier two, tier three uh, cities. So I think there is, uh, there is, you will see a lot of action in years to come in that space. Just a cursory glance at uh, telecom and consulting sectors are, uh, I believe that they are seeing the highest rate of return to office, like 75, as high as 100% of them are coming back to work from office. Your comments, please. I look, I, uh, I do not have information specific to these companies or these, these sectors uh, because this data is still fairly anecdotal. You don't have enough trends Same to much. say who's coming in and, and how, how much and so on and so forth. Uh, but um, look, there is an increasing amount of, uh, in the, and, and I can say the BFSI industry, I think they, the banking financial services insurance, I think they have on very large numbers come back. Uh, you are right. A lot of consulting workforce is also uh, back. Telecom, I'm not so sure. I don't have insights to be able to, to say, but there are other industries also who are now significant, significantly back to office in very large numbers. Just a couple of uh, questions on residential. Uh, look at residential property. Will another interest rate hike impact home sales demand? I mean, we're hearing stories, Anurag, of a best performing September month in the last 10 years, despite rising interest rates, uh, also an increase in stamp duty. And of course, you know, at the end of the day, we are India. Shraad falling in this particular period. What really is the reality? Um, <laughs> look, there are several questions that uh, merit long answers over there, but I'll, I'll keep it brief. So, look, our residential industry fundamentally is a very strong industry. We are a country where there is a shortage of dwelling units. People, the home ownership is still very, very small in India. Uh, I'm not saying that everyone needs to own a home. And as uh, people get more mobile and they, they get more aspirational and, and so on and so forth, you wish should be able to rent uh, more readily what you have rather than... So I'm not saying that the, the pendulum should go to extreme where everyone owns a home. That's not going to happen. It should probably not, should not happen. But uh, there is a lot more that needs to happen in that space. A lot more people need to be able to own homes and all that. So the, the fundamentals are very strong. What has happened in the last couple of years is a lot of catch up has happened for various reasons. Um, so I think those those things have been discussed in the media in great detail. But a lot of catch up has happened and I think the trend will continue uh, as I can see. Yes, interest rates have gone up. Uh, but again, our research and our uh, sensitivity says that unless the, the rates go up very, very sharply in a very short time, that trend is not going to change. I don't think that there is a cooling effect that necessarily is going to play out. Because look, a lot of our demand is genuine demand. Yeah. It's not the investors playing in that market. It's it's now people who want to buy homes and they want to be able to live in them and, and so on. They're the ones who are buying. So uh, I don't think that you can necessarily uh, get them away by, uh, by some small change in interest rates because the, the, the demand is real and, uh, and and it's a fairly attractive uh, market at this point. Are builders willing to pass on the benefits post the center's anti-inflammatory measures? Um, uh, in the short answer is yes. I think the developers have, uh, have, um, have really played along and cooperated with the government in everywhere. They have benefited also uh, when the stamp duty relaxation uh, happened. I think that that helped the developer community a lot. But also wherever there has been and uh, there has been an opportunity, there haven't been too many, but wherever there have been opportunities, I think the developers have passed on the benefits to the end consumer. And truth be told, I mean, 
uh, the the cost of construction has gone up significantly. Commodity prices have gone up uh, very sharply over the uh, past uh, two or three years. Uh, every metal, steel, copper, uh, aluminum, etc., cement, everything has has gone up. Uh, the prices have escalated in double digits, as sometimes as much as fifty percent. Uh, and the developers have still absorbed a lot of that cost inflation and uh, and passed it on to to consumers uh, without uh, a price hike or a price hike or uh, if not without a price hike, not a commensurate or an equitable uh, price hike. So I think they have played ball and they've been fairly cooperative in passing on and facilitating. Uh, uh, the liquidation of the inventory and, and being able to sell houses to end consumers. Just one last one on residential. I mean, uh, here's a country that has gone through the pandemic and everybody is a little more obsessive about space. You know, you need larger space to yourself. What if, you know, is the big question everybody's asking. Let's look at high-end residential markets. In the seven major cities of this country, how is the monthly average rent inexpensive residential colonies, high-end residences shaped up, if you look at this last two-year periods, uh, given that tenants are now looking for large-size houses. Uh, sorry, so is your question to say how the rental trends are going? The rental trends, exactly, rental trends. Look, uh, that specific market is a fairly small uh, segment. So it's difficult to predict rental trends as such. But in the micro markets, if, if you speak just of that very small segment, the answer is there has been a significant uh, strengthening of rentals over there, which actually tells you that there is a significant significant demand for larger space. And look, uh, we are a we are a we are a growing country. There is increasing prosperity that is flowing in uh, in the country. So the people are being able to earn more. And they have aspirations to live better quality life, better spaces, larger spaces, and so on and so forth. So I think it's only natural that people aspire to buy bigger apartments or homes and all that. And then in cases, uh, people wanting to buy second homes or or or, or uh, you know destination homes or holiday homes or uh, leisure properties and all that. So whatever you may call. Uh, and uh, all of that has done very, very well and continues to do uh, very well. There's a great interest in, in people in, in buying and even renting uh, larger and interesting marquee properties. Uh, we always ask our CEOs some lifestyle questions before wrapping up. So, uh, sure. your favorite travel or holiday destination and what did you most enjoy about that space, that place? Uh, what did you end up doing there? Ah, difficult one. Um, look, I, I can't say I have a favorite travel destination as such, uh, but uh, amongst, let's say, the top three for me is is Thailand. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's short travel time. Uh, 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 there are direct flights, uh, so it's easy. It's very economical. It's a it's a lovely place. There are great facilities. Hotels are very nice. Restaurants, food scene is very very good, very vibrant, uh, and it's 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 not expensive. It doesn't hurt you, and there's some great stuff to do. So there's uh, there's a lot of water sports and stuff like that. I play golf. Um, so Thailand has some exceptional uh, golf uh, over there, which is tremendously enjoyable and very affordable. Um, so I'm going to say, yeah, it's one of the in the most um, most uh, in in the top three places. What kind of music do you enjoy listening to? Your favorite artists or bands? Uh, so I'm um, I'm a uh, I'm from this guy. So uh, I obviously am a, a rock music uh, person. My all-time favorite band is Pink Floyd. Um, so that's the music that I enjoy the most. Um, Eagles, Pink Floyd. Uh, that's that's my that's my favorite music. Your go-to music, classic rock. Can't go wrong with that. Any concert Absolutely. or music performance that you went to recently or in the past uh, that is really memorable? You could describe it. Um, so I, 
I went to uh, I went to a Pink Floyd concert, and of all the places, we uh, the three of us, my three friend, two two other friends of mine from college, three of us, we went to Helsinki in Finland to watch Roger Waters. Wow. So that was uh, an incredible experience. I mean, who goes to Finland uh, for a music concert? And when we wanted to go, there were only uh, a select few concerts. Uh, Roger Water was a, was on tour, and he was performing in Stockholm and Helsinki those days when we wanted to go, and uh, we couldn't get tickets to Stockholm. Uh, it's not vastly different from Helsinki, I guess. Uh, but Helsinki, we got uh, and we went into a stadium and watched. Uh, stayed there for two two days, three days, and and came back. So very very memorable. And what a concert! Phenomenal. So as a Pink Floyd fan. Is it wish you were here, or is it comfortably numb? <laughs> which do you prefer? Uh, comfortably numb, <laughs> which actually depends on on what you're doing. But um, comfortably numb is probably. Yeah. My last question is: What's your fashion sense? I mean, do you like what do you like to wear in the boardroom or when you're working, and of course outside it when you're relaxing? Ah, uh, that's a difficult one. But look. Uh, I'm not a major fashion person, but uh, in in our industry, in our business, uh, formal dressing always helps. Uh, so I'm a suit person. I'm very comfortable wearing uh, uh, suits, uh, white shirts, blue blue shirts. That's all, and and a nice tie. I'm very fond of silk ties, uh, and over the years, I've bought a lot of uh, expensive as well as cheap ties. Uh, uh, and uh, I have a great collection. I love wearing them whenever the, the, the ch- whenever I get a chance. In, and unfortunately, in uh, in this day and age, there are not as many people who are wearing suits and ties. So you do feel a little odd once in a while. But uh, I still enjoy it tremendously. This is a fabulous conversation. Um, I really appreciate your time, uh, Anurag Mathur, CEO of Civils India, and I hope to catch up with you soon again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rishi. Appreciate this. That's Minding My Business, the CEO story, season three. We're going to have another uh, CEO from the IPC space for you next time around. Remember, it's powered by Nucleus Office Parks. From me, Rishi K., it's bye-bye.